Well, that was a freaking disaster. That was not exactly the way we write it up. Welcome to a post-opening day, Rico Bronia. Now, granted, this is hours after opening day. Today was a very long day for me personally. I went to opening day. I flew back to the radio station, did a couple of hours on the air, and then met up with my old partner, Joe Beningo. And did his podcast event. You could definitely check out the Oda Paint podcast. Joe does a great job. So then I came back after a long day and I said, we need to talk about this disaster that was opening day 2024. Before I complain, before I bitch, before I whine, before I answer any questions one may have, let me just remind everybody something I warned 24 hours ago on the Rico. And that is, it's one freaking game. Okay, it may not feel like one freaking game. I think if you invested time going to opening day and freezing your collective tuckuses off inside City Field, it doesn't feel like one game. If you paid a lot of money for tickets, it doesn't feel like one game. If you spent a lot of money on beer, it doesn't feel like one game. If you just had a bad experience because you sat in traffic or I don't know, hypothetically, you have a boss that's a douche that makes it feel like more than one game. And I understand that. And that is how I feel. Like I feel all of those emotions expressed into one. When you watch your baseball team get one hit, one hit, one effing hit. And I get it. Freddie Peralta is a good pitcher. Hoffman and I know full well. We have faced him many times in fantasy. Freddie Peralta is legit. No question about it. But when you make him look like Cy Young over six innings and the makeshift Milwaukee bullpen without Devin Williams just dominates you for another three innings, it's tough to just digest it, spit it out, and have that same logical, well, it's only one game. Because it doesn't feel like one game. Opening day, in a lot of ways, doesn't feel like one game. For Yankee fans, after they won their first game of the season, dramatically against their blood rival, it doesn't feel like one game. When we lost to Cincinnati back in 2005 because Braden Looper decided to you-know-what all over the mound in about 35 seconds, it didn't feel like one game. So I'm telling you emotionally how many hours since this game ended. We're recording this about six and a half hours after this game ended. It doesn't feel like one game because it was embarrassing. It was putrid. And I think what What adds to it is even though I don't represent this, I have been more of a positive Met fan over the last few months. I have believed that this lineup, even before they signed J.D. Martinez, would ultimately be the strength of this team. So for me, this doesn't qualify, but for a lot of other people, there were concerns and there was negativity coming into this season. And so when something fulfills your negativity right out of the gate, it makes it worse. It's just the way it is. It's just the way we are as human beings. If you're concerned about one aspect of your team and then that team proceeds to show you that the first game of the season, it makes it feel a lot worse. Uh, Am I giving up on this Met offense because of one game? I'm not. But I'm disgusted. We all are. We sat there on opening day. We tried to have good vibes. We tried to give everybody big, warm ovations. And outside of Starling Marte, who did hit the ball hard a couple of times, I'll give him that. That's probably the only positive you take out of this slog. They didn't show you anything offensively. And that's a tough pill to swallow. And so it's not about being 0-1. It's not about just losing the first game of the season. I think it's about the way they lost the first game of the season. That's a real kick in the balls, especially opening day is a holiday. You know, you take off work. You tell your boss, maybe you don't tell your boss. That's completely up to you. I respect both sides of that. And then you go and you're expecting to be rewarded. And instead, we got this. Now, I got a lot of thoughts about the experience and a lot of thoughts about what we saw on day one of this season. But to you, Pete Hoffman, how do you feel? Are you feeling all right? Are you negative today? Are you positive today? Are you going to spin this? It's a, You tell me. I mean, there's a couple of ways to spin this. Um, I don't feel good. No, it was it was pretty bad. I will say this much. I hate Reese Hoskins, and he spiked the hell out of Jeff McNeil, and I'm happy to see. I know people dog on McNeil a lot because of, you know, he's always upset when something negative happens. 
but I need to see some form of life. I understand today the bats weren't there. I mean, really nothing was there. It's the first day of the season, but I need to see more of that energy. And let me tell you something. If this team gets into a fight or two in the next couple of weeks, I'm okay with it. I need to see something, some form of life. If it's not with the bats, it's with the energy of the team. All right, let's get to this because it's funny how that's the first thing you brought up. And I think there's a lot of Met fans who walk away from opening day 2024. And maybe that's going to be their memory. Their memory is going to be Reese Hoskins sliding very late to Jeff McNeil. Jeff McNeil being upset about it, yelling about it. Reese Hoskins not saying a damn word till he got to the dugout, then doing the, uh, you know, the crying face. And the Mets meekly losing. There were two things that annoyed me about this situation. First of all, as far as if the slide is dirty or not, I think the problem we all have is we don't know. We don't know anymore. I'll give you a great example of what we don't know, not to belabor this. But early in the game, after Starling Marte hit a home run, DJ Stewart drew a walk. And DJ Stewart was promptly picked off by the catcher by William Contreras. And if you look at the replay, Reese Hoskins, same guy, was blocking first base. Now, normally I would say, eh, it's, that's baseball. But considering what was called in spring training, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like Lindor's blocking of second base during uh, spring training is nothing like the way Hoskins was blocking first base of DJ Stewart. So my response would be, boy, this doesn't make any sense. There's inconsistencies. Granted, it's a new rule. And I think when it comes to sliding in a second base sometimes, I don't know. I don't know what's legal or not. Now, Reese came in very late. No question about it. I know that it's easy to go on social media or go on YouTube and find examples of Jeff McNeil illegally sliding. And by the way, I'm sure he has. But that's irrelevant. That's what aboutism. Let's talk about this play. Did Reese Hoskins come in late? Probably. Now, the Mets challenged it, and the umpires didn't overrule it. So it would have been a double play. That's what they could have called if it was an illegal slide. They chose not to. Turned out to be no harm, no foul. Michael Tonkin got through it anyway. But the two things that annoyed me was, A, if you're Jeff McNeil and you're that upset and you're very, very bothered, and he was clearly very bothered, instead of whining about it, instead of yelling about it, do something about it. And I'm not trying to be a violent guy here, but if you're that pissed off, fight him. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, just fight the guy then. You know, you just mentioned this team needs to show fight. Well, then fight. You know, yelling and bitching about it doesn't do anything. You know, it's not like the Mets were in a rush to have a fight. Francisco Lindor's out there just looking on. The bullpen's jogging in casually. If you're annoyed, be annoyed. But that's not really what bothers me the most. It bothers me because, again, he's right there, Jeff. I mean, Reese Hoskins is on the ground. You are two feet away from him. You're yelling at him. If you're that mad, do something about it. As The Rock would say, don't sing it, just bring it. Right? He does nothing. He does nothing. By the way, does that bother you, Pete? I mean, does it bother you? freaking deal. What'd he do? He just yelled at him. That's all he did. Oh, yeah, but to be fair, Reese Hoskins was laying there like a little bitch, and what's he going to do, kick him in the face? Like, he really couldn't do anything unless he starts pounding oh, him on the floor. No, it's true. He it's couldn't true. do anything. And and Reese Hoskins did nothing until he got to his bench. He starts going, I agree. Eh. I mean, come I on, dude. I No, no. I agree that Reese Hoskins didn't say a damn word until he went back to the dugout. But if you want to fight, then fight. That's just the way I look at it now. Like, if you stop with the yelling. Stop with the complaint. Just fight then. And then the other thing, and this is not McNeil's fault because he didn't get another at bat. And I want to clarify that because I said this on the air. Hey, you're that pissed off. Do something about it with your sticks. In McNeil's case, his last at bat had already occurred. It occurred in the seventh inning when the Mets had their best rally <laughs> because it really was their best rally. They got a leadoff walk from Lindor and he went to second on a wild pitch. But I think before that, there were the weak foul pop ups by Pete Alonzo and Jeff McNeil. So Jeff didn't have a chance to respond, but the rest of the team did. DJ Stewart, Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Harrison Bader, Brandon Nemo, Francisco, they all could have done something. And they didn't do anything. The bats went down meekly. And that annoys me too. Because if as a team you're so riled up by a moment, then have that be the rallying cry. Like, if the Mets had rallied in the eighth and ninth inning of this game, not only would we have talked about the rally, I guarantee we would have looked back at that play and that moment in the eighth inning and said, wow. That galvanized the team. 
that got that got them turned around. That really sparked them. And they did nothing. And I think what it does for a lot of us as Met fans is it reinforces a worry that this is a soft team. You know, we had that worry from two years ago with the way they got punched in the face by the Atlanta Braves. It didn't mean the season was over, but it turned into the season being over. They didn't have to lose two out of three to San Diego, but they did. And then last year was just a, you know, I guess you could argue last year was just a disaster. That softness maybe didn't play that big of a part in it. But then a day like today, first game of the season, Jeff McNeil's annoyed about something. He yells, he screams, the bats go boom, 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 game over. And it's a worry. And maybe it's an irrational worry, but it's a legitimate worry about this roster and about this core and about the softness that I think we worried about from two years ago. Listen, uh, again, it's the first game, so – I don't want to sit there and say like we need an all out brawl because that 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 can come with frustration over the next few months. Um, they, dude, the hit, the the batting, the the lifelessness of the offense is definitely a pain in the ass. Uh, but again, like it's it's opening day. I'm almost happy we lost. I'm almost happy it's we we got the worst loss of the season out of the way. I mean, this can't <laughs> it can't get any worse than this. I mean, we got Stolly Marte minus that one home run, which hey, by the way, cleanup hitter maybe. Over Jeff McNeil? <laughs> well, oh, oh, so I'm glad you brought that up. So there's a few things about Carlos Mendoza we need to address. I said the other day on the Rico, we'll find out about him real soon. And we have one day now. And we have one game. And so there are some lessons of Carlos Mendoza from one game. So let's explain the lessons of Carlos Mendoza. Number one, he is, and I, and I say this respectfully. I know this is going to come across kind of uh, harshly, but this is, I'm not saying this necessarily in a negative way. It's just reality. He's full of crap. Now, you may hear that and say, what? How's that respectful? Well, respectful in terms of it's okay sometimes to be full of crap. Like, there isn't a rule that you have to be a straight shooter, especially when you're the manager of a baseball team. But his full of crap meter that he showed us was Jeff McNeil batting cleanup. And I apologize because... I said on WFAN, I said on the Rico even a few days ago when Sal was a guest, I said, let's not read into McNeil hitting cleanup. Mendoza even said, don't read into it. He's trying to get at bats. Guy missed a lot of spring training. And so by batting him fourth instead of sixth or seventh, you're making sure that he gets at bats. And I buy, I, I bought it because I had no reason not to buy it. You know, I had no track record of Carlos Mendoza being full of crap. So why would I not buy it? And so what happens? And what happens? Jeff McNeil's in cleanup on opening day. Now, two things. Is it the end of the world? No. Is it the worst lineup decision? I'm not saying it is. We got to get off our high horses that a hitter like McNeil can't hit cleanup. He can. It's 2024. It's a different world. But would I do it? No. If it was up to me? No. Now, granted, the guy I would have sent up there didn't do anything with the stick today in Francisco Alvarez. I would have hit him cleanup. But it's the first sign that Carlos Mendoza has a full of crap tendency to him because he BS'd us. You know, what he could have said a week ago when McNeil will hit and clean up was, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing. Maybe, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Instead, we got to don't read into it. Well, maybe we should have read into it because you're batting him clean up. I, I do think that considering their options right now without J.D. Martinez, it's not lunacy to bat him cleanup it is not this horrific decision about him cleanup would is, is it something i would do no i i've laid out what my lineup would be prior to them even signing jd martinez i'd hit alvarez cleanup and then i would go mcneil Marte. now pete mentioned hey d starling look good you want to hit him cleanup i don't know if i'm doing that after one day <laughs> But he did look good at the plate. He was the ultimate positive from this game. He hits the home run in the second. He hits that rope in the seventh inning, which I'll tell you off the bat at City Field, man, especially with the win. I thought there was a shot. I thought that was a shot not to get out, but to go over the right fielder's head and at least score a run and make it a one-run game and get a runner in scoring position with two outs. Not that necessarily that would have made a difference, but – I did think off the bat that had a chance to do major, major damage. Unfortunately, it didn't. So we learned 
full of crap meter about Carlos Mendoza, but that's not it. That's not the only thing we learned. Bullpen, I didn't learn that much. Um, I thought he pulled Quintana at the exact right time. I said it to my dad, like as it was happening, you know, when William Contreras hit the sacrifice fly that gave the Brewers the lead, I thought off the bat that run was not scoring. I thought lazy fly ball, short right field, maybe even in the infield, the ball carried a little bit. Marte had a tough time getting under it. And so it was a good decision by uh, Monasterio to run because, you know what, forced the action, forced Starling Marte to have to make a play. But after the sack fly, he gives up the hit to Christian Yelich. And at that point, I'm like, you know what, get him out, especially with Reese Hoskins coming up to righty. Uh, I didn't trust Drew Smith necessarily, but early in the season, give him a shot. And to Drew Smith's credit, he got Reese Hoskins to strike out. Drew Smith pitched well, faced four batters, got them all out. I know you hate him, Pete, but... You know, we got to call it like it is. It's, it's well one today. game. It's one game. <laughs> well, that's all I'm saying. I said he pitched well today. I didn't say he's uh, he's the Cy Young Award winner. I said he pitched well today. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh, Jorge Lopez. Jorge Lopez wasn't bad. He gave up that leadoff double to Jake Bowers. That was the issue. And then the bunt hit and then the ground down. And it's, you know, once you gave up the leadoff double, you were kind of screwed. There was a good chance that run was going to come into score. So, I didn't read that much out of the bullpen. He got the innings out of Michael Tonkin. He went to Lopez. He went to Smith in the fifth inning. But here's what we did learn about Carlos Mendoza. Ninth inning, you're down by two runs. Harrison Bader is at the plate against a young, hard-throwing right-hander. And you've got Joey Wendell on your bench, and you didn't go to him. And that's the guy I was thinking of. It's not Tyrone Taylor. It's not Zach Short. I guess it could be Narvaez. I'm not sure. But no, nah, not off the top. Off the top, it's Joey Wendell. It's, hey, let me use one of my left-handed bats uh, as opposed to Harrison Bader, who is a fourth outfielder. We all know that. So he's stuck with Bader. Now, is that going to be a common thing? Is that what he's going to do? I don't know. But our first sign from Carlos Mendoza was he showed a lot of patience to his guys. He had a lot of patience to his regulars. But I'm sitting there thinking, go to Joey Wendell. Again, doesn't mean the whole inning's going to change, but that's my thought. Ninth inning, gets the tough righty. Go to Joey Wendell. He did not do that. Now, there were boos at City Field on this opening day Friday. And you may ask, Evan, who got the boos? Brett Beatty got some boos. Brett Beatty is going to be one of those guys that – this crowd, this fan base is not going to be very patient for it. And that doesn't mean we're ogres to young players. It means he played a lot last year and he was not good last year. <laughs> I heard one guy after Beatty struck out in the sixth looking that screamed, get me Vientos. Call up Vientos. <laughs> what, what do they say after he almost butchered that, that ball to, to McNeil? Where we let, which led to Hoskins taking him out. I mean, his glove still is a major issue. Yeah, you know what's funny? Nothing was said about that because I think it was purely the distraction of the Hoskins play. But yeah, look, Brett Beatty, I don't think is ever going to become a, a goal glover. Maybe he can become average. I think there's been signs of improvement. He's got to hit. That's really what it comes down to. He's got to hit, and he's going to get that chance. He's going to get that chance to play every freaking day, and he is going to have to find a way to hit. How long of a rope does he have? I don't know. You know, we talked about that the other day. I, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But keep an eye on this. The New York Mets AAA affiliate, the Syracuse Mets, had their opening day today. Did you see uh, who performed what on opening day uh, there, Pete? I, I mean, it looked like that's we have an all-star team down there. <laughs> what the hell are we doing? We got Luis Angel Acuna and Drew Gilbert going a back-to-back and a belly-to-belly, and your boy Joey Lucchese pitched well. So that's something, right? That's got to point you up. Something. It, it's great to have a, an awesome AAA team. I hope they win the whole thing. <laughs> It, it, you know what it is? It's something to keep an eye on because, and that's the other thing we don't really know about um, about David Stearns. We we saw this with Billy Epler. He was so patient to ever call up his young guys. Like it took forever to call up young prospects. I don't know how aggressive he's going to be. I have no idea. By the way, taking a look at how things went. So Gilbert and Acuna went back to back. Those are their only hits. G-Man Choi went two for five. 
Mark Vientos went 0 for 3. Uh, Jose Iglesias went 2 for 3, if you care about that. And your boy Joey Lucchese, five scoreless innings. Or I should say five innings, one run, it was unearned. So good performance by Joey Lucchese. And, and here's the best trivia question. Not a trivia question. You may have heard it already. When Gilbert and Acuna went back-to-back, -back, they did it off a former New York Met. So you're not aware of this, Pete. I can see by Pete's face he's not I, aware. I, I'm trying to think of who it was. It Phil Bickford. <laughs> I don't think he's been picked up yet. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll give you this hint. He was a guy that for a while had some promise. You know, we were like, oh, we may have something with him as a starter. Then he was out of a bullpen and never put it all together. And now he's jumping around minor league teams. Aaron Heilman? You know what? This guy reminded me of Aaron Heilman, so it's a good guess. Rob, Robert Gazelman. Uh, the great Robert Gazelman. <laughs> Gazelman. Jesus. That's right. He's the one who hit the back-to-back -back home runs. Um, as far as, uh, let's see, is there anything else I need to address? I'm trying to think. Uh, so the Mets lost on opening day. Did anything else happen? I was at opening day, but then I went to work. You know, I actually showed up at about, I don't know, 4.45, did the last hour and a half of the show, gave some thoughts on the Mets. Oh, I, I do have a real question, and a lot of people, I, I swear to God, I've been hit up all day, and I never do about you, but this is serious. Go ahead. Did you score the entire game? Were you able to do that? That's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked. So I was committed uh, to trying to get back to be on, and it didn't work as well as I had hoped, but I wanted to get back to be on the air as the game ended so that Met fans who got in the car, I would be on and we could talk about the game. That did not work out well for me. My train situation leaving City Field, not ideal. Not going to get into the minutia of it, but it did not work out well. So I left City Field in the eighth inning. So I didn't score the last two innings, but it's already been taken care of. I've got my ways. You know, I. I have my mental notes of what was happening. First of all, it's not that difficult to know what happened. <laughs> the Mets went down. Bing, 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 bing. But the scorecard is all fine. I could probably, oh, there are some changes at City Field. And I don't know how many people this affects. So I, I definitely want to warn you that, especially if you're not a season ticket holder, maybe you don't care about this. I was affected by something. And look, I'm, I'm fine. I've got my ways to get over this crap. So I'm really looking out for anyone who's in my section or has my level of tickets. So I don't want you to think it's me bitching because, look, I, I understand. I'm blessed. I'm on the radio. I have the ability to, like, a press credential kind of get in wherever I want. So this is not about me whining. But the seats I have, I sit in the Excelsior level and the 300 level. And for years, since City Field opened, the entrance we would use was the Hodges entrance, the Gil Hodges entrance, which is to the right of home plate by Lot G. So my dad gets to the gate and he texts me and he says, they're not letting me in. I said, what are you talking about? You know, not letting in. And I look at my ticket and it no longer says Hodges. I'm like, what? This doesn't make any sense. So they turn this Hodges entrance, which has always been this great entrance, I think for season ticket holders and for those in a 300 level. And they turned it into a private club entrance. And the only way you can get in is the Jackie Robinson Rotunda. Nothing wrong with the Jackie Robinson Rotunda, but there are longer lines at the Jackie Robinson Rotunda. So my dad had this look on his face like, oh, God, boy, that Tuesday night I come to, it's going to be a pain in the ass. But then I reminded him, no one else will be there. Don't worry. The lines won't be too long at the Jackie <laughs> Robinson Rotunda. But what I was saying to my dad was, because again, this, I can get around this, so I'm not complaining for myself. But what annoyed me was I don't like when teams raise prices and then take something away from you. You want to raise prices because it's the cost of doing business. It, it is what it is. It sucks, especially off of a year in which you don't make the playoffs. But I'm not a fan of raising ticket prices and then saying, oh, by the way, you're going to get a less of a feature than you used to have. And for a lot of people who went in with the Hodges entrance, and I'm – I don't know if they did this to the Seaver entrance, which is on the other side. That kind of sucks. That stinks. You know, you have an easier way in. Now it's a harder way in. So for anyone affected by that, I feel you. And it stinks. And you know, what can I do about it? I can't do anything about it other than bring attention to it. So for anyone who went to City Field today 
And besides watching our team only get one hit, they were also frustrated by the fact that it was a pain in the ass to get in because they changed gates. It stinks. It just, uh, it stinks. Some people want to know, um, asking about the, uh, the Met city dancers. How are they? I didn't even notice them. Oh. They, they announced them about a half hour before the game and I barely paid attention. And then during the game, I never noticed them. So that's something at least on opening day. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to, Oh, by the way, you're wrong about something. I'm wrong. Uh -oh. Yeah. The hall yeah, of fame. I, my, yeah. My premonition was right. The hall of fame oh. being taken away sucks. I couldn't find the plaques and, and I'm sure they're there. I couldn't find anything. Now, I, I don't know what they did with it. I'm, again, I'm sure they're around, but I went in through the Robinson Rotunda. There was a crazy line to go into the uh, the gift area, the, the, the shop. I had no interest in that. And I didn't see anything. So I get it. Mets need to make more money. They need to sell more merchandise. But Hall of Fame not existing is a problem. Now, I'm going back on Saturday and Sunday, taking the family on Sunday, and we'll walk around. And maybe with less people there, because I assume the crowds will be a little bit smaller. I'll have a different view, but on opening day, freaking disaster. No Hall of Fame. They got rid of it, and it's spread out somewhere around City Field. So I got to tell you, besides just the game, it was not a great opening day experience. Was the weather okay? I mean, if it seemed it seemed decent, but oh. it was windy. So it's hit or miss depending on where you sit. City Field is uh, pretty miraculous like this. You could be outside City, and it could be very nice. Depending on where you sit and if the breeze or the wind hits you, that's going to make a big difference. And sometimes I go down to my seat and I feel the wind and it's cold. And sometimes I go down, I feel nothing. It's very hit or miss. So for me, again, you're sitting in a different section. Maybe the wind didn't hit you as much. It was very windy, very, very cold. It was a very, very cold day, uh, but better than rain, right? I'll take that. Uh, yeah. Now, listen, here's as a, as a fat guy, I'm a foodie. So there was a lot of different food uh that was introduced i know that you're just a dog guy but did you did you did you have any did you have that rainbow cookie um roll thing that they they created the one day i will not eat at city field or at least look for food is opening day because there's just so many people and so the lines are everywhere so the food experiment i will start to get a feel for as the season rolls on i love opening day it's a holiday uh everyone around the station knows it's a holiday except for one jackass whose head is kind of shaped like a, a sexual object. But outside of that, like it's a holiday, right? But I love day two and day seven and day 12 and day 15 because a, there's less people there. So you can walk around and see all these various things. So I'll explore it as the season goes on, but opening day on every level was bad. It was not good. It was not fun. And we lost. Now, I will say the season is not over. I got to put that message out there. It's not over. But day one did not start well. All right. One final question for yes. me. Did you make up with Spike? Who? Spike? Who's that? I don't know. Some guy. <laughs> I think he's still at the office. I don't know. I haven't been there all week. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. All I know is I'll be on the air Monday. Everything's okay. And I had a horrible Friday, just like everybody else who skipped work to go see our crappy baseball team get one hit. Now, this will not be the only Rico of the weekend uh, for anyone who's new to the Rico. And it's funny. I met a lot of people at Joe Beningo's podcast event, and there are a lot of Yankee fans who listen to the Rico. A lot of them. I mean, there must have been like three or four different Yankee fans that came to me tonight with Joe and said, big Yankee fan, love the Rico. And I'm like, what? Okay, cool, thanks, but what you doing? They must love to suffer like us. I so the other way to do it, they listen to the Rico Brody podcast. I think that's got to be it. So <laughs> for anyone new to the Rico, after every series, we give you a new Rico Brody. Sometimes we do pop-ups like this, reacting to opening day, but we can always guarantee you within 12 hours of that game ending, because obviously we do have lives, we try to balance it as best as we can, you know, spending time with the family, but then giving you our Rico duties. So after this series ends on Sunday, it'll probably be late at night because I'm engaging in a double header on Sunday. I'm taking the whole family to Mets Brewers and then half the family is going home. 
And the other half, me and my oldest, we're not done after Mets Brewers. We are driving to Barkley Center to see the Brooklyn Nets take on And this is really why we're going, if you want to be fair. I'll be honest about it. The Brooklyn Nets against the L.A. Lakers. And a chance to see LeBron James. And I think with great players, you'll want that crack to see him. Like, my dad took me to a lot of sporting events, and I I certainly ain't crapping on him. He's the best. I never saw Michael Jordan. Never saw him. Until, (laughs) there's a caveat, until he came out of retirement and played for the Wizards. And I happen to live in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I saw Michael plenty of times after that. But there was a moment where I was like, man, I'm never going to see him play live. So LeBron's in town, assuming he plays, obviously. Uh, I'm taking my oldest to see the Nets against the Lakers. To see the Nets, but really to see LeBron James. So at some point late Sunday night, we'll definitely give you a Rico. Uh, We will respond to a lot of your emails. You can email us to ricob at gmail.com. I appreciate all your support against... uh, my pencil neck geek boss. And of course you can voicemail us. The number anytime you want to leave a voicemail is 725-222-8699. What up? You nailed it. And by the way, this is the first ever, it was an experiment, first ever live Rico on YouTube. So we're going to start to incorporate this as well. Uh, We'll set it up a little bit more now because we know it works. That is true. This was a live Rico that nobody saw because we never told anybody. But at some point, we will start to tell you that we will be live on YouTube. So, yeah, this was uh, what do they call those things like a test drive or something like that. Soft yeah. launch. Yeah, like a uh, yeah, just a demo demo version is good. Yeah, that's how much. That's how much I love my job, Pete. That we're working on a late Friday night doing a live YouTube and a podcast. God forbid I miss a few hours on Good Friday <laughs> to see the Mets play, right? Hey, by the way, uh, just because I have to do a shameless plug here, if for anybody that is listening live or watching live, I'm going to be on air in a few hours myself on WFAN after the uh, NCAA tournament. So tune in after this. And here's the, the good MFN. news. If you're not listening live and you're listening to this on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, we have a rewind app on the Odyssey app. So you can always rewind and listen to Pete Hoffman. So there's a lot of ways you could do it, just like you could rewind and listen to Evan and Tiki from Friday, especially, uh, I'd say, from 2 to 2.15, if you missed any of that, or the Midday Show. And final plug for you, as I I have your book hanging over here. Nice! It's not not signed, you jerk. I asked you to sign it for me. Oh, my apologies. I will definitely (laughs) sign it. My Mets Bible on sale April 2nd. Well, thank you very much for listening, for downloading. Of course, download Rico Bronia, subscribe so you never miss a, a new episode. And don't let opening day get you too down. Maybe it's a sign of good things to come. <laughs> At least I tell myself that. <laughs> Happy opening day from Rico Bronia.